Professor Philip Nolan, thank you so much for being with us here today. So you took over the role of Director General of Science Foundation Ireland back in January of this year, January 2022. But before that, I suppose you became very much a household name in Ireland. Um, during the pandemic in your, your role as, and I'm going to I'll check this, as chair of NEFET's Epidemiological Modelling Advisory Group during the pandemic. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit before we talk about the, the SFI about those years and I suppose if there were learnings that came out of the pandemic when it comes to science, research, innovation. It was a pleasure to talk to you Anne, first of all. Uh, and yes, I mean, those two, two and a half years, it was an immense privilege, first of all, uh, to be able to serve in that way. Uh, it brought together many of the things in one sense that I trained for. Um, and, and it was a great pleasure to be able to put myself at the service of, of Irish society in that way. There's a lot to be learned from it. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about it. The first and most fundamental lesson is just how important it is to have raw talent in a crisis. So when the pandemic first broke and we began to prepare as a country for, well, first of all, what's going to happen and what are we going to do about it? We pulled together a team that spanned the spectrum of scientific disciplines from applied mathematics out to veterinary epidemiology. And even in that little piece, there's, there's something interesting there because human epidemiologists had turned their attention to non-communicable diseases, things like cancer and obesity and heart disease. It was the veterinary epidemiologists that had retained an interest in infectious disease because of their importance in, in animals. And the first thing that struck me was that we had these enormously talented people. They, they were working on different things. The applied mathematicians were interested, for instance, in the diffusion of information and misinformation on social media which became relevant later. And the veterinary epidemiologists were interested in, for instance, uh, tuberculosis. But they could pivot. Their talent was such that they could pivot to turn their attention to this new uh, virus uh, with its new properties. And the applied mathematicians could turn their tools and techniques to studying this new problem. So the first lesson for us as a country is we hadn't necessarily planned to have those people there for this purpose, uh, but we had this very broad base of research talent, which we'd built up in the late 90s, early 2000s, and so on, with the um, early period of Science Foundation Ireland, of uh, ICSERT and IRCHSS as they were then, uh, and PRTLI, the Programme for Investment in Third Level Institutions. So that's, that was lesson one. Uh, if we invest in talent, uh, the importance of that talent is partly obvious at the time, but partly only uh, clear when you need them to work on a particular problem. Second thing that I think is uh, really interesting for me was the importance and value of um, public engagement, uh, and I mean that in its deepest sense, and public literacy. I think um, we were very impressed by just how engaged people and the media were, uh, just the lengths they went to inform themselves and the kind of deep literacy there is both in the media and the population to understand quite complex issues and factor those into their individual decision making and collective decision making. Which brings me to the third thing, which is the challenge of politics. Um, it was my first time truly embedded in the political system. And I really came to admire, like, it's making hard decisions is hard. Um, and what I was impressed by was, at its core, the political system is interested in leadership. They face great complexities. So in the middle of the pandemic, there were still other major issues that they needed to focus on, uh, housing, geopolitics. Um, and just the challenge for them in kind of synthesizing democracies constant conflicts between individual and collective, between short-term and long-term. And I think, interesting, I think both ourselves and government learned just the value then in that context of bringing together the evidence in a formal and well-synthesized way, and then kind of persistence, humility, engagement with the system to say, well, here's what the evidence says. At the end of the day, 
you have to make the decisions because it is a democracy. Um, but here's the evidence and, and here's what we think and here's an expert opinion. Um, and to keep coming back with that, um, sometimes the decision isn't going to go the way that you might want, uh, uh, particularly if it's a really difficult decision. There's lots of trade-offs and lots of complexities. But the important thing is, first of all, to stick to the evidence, and secondly, to kind of be persistent and be constantly trying harder to be clear uh, in what the evidence tells people. It's important to communicate with the citizenry in general, as well as with its political uh, elected representatives, um, but to be kind of clear and persistent in, in, in coming back and saying, well, this is what the evidence shows, so can we look at where we're going now? Yeah. And the communications were remarkable. I, I mean, th those regular press conferences and everything mm. were incredible, and it, you know, and we'll, we'll talk about that, uh, more about that, about the public engagement side, if you don't mind, yeah. but um, I, I suppose, speaking of crisis, you know, in a previous interview that I, that I watched with you, you were describing the pandemic as part of a broader ecological crisis and a collective action problem, not unlike climate. So can you tell me a little bit more about the parallels of that sort of that collective action problem, which is the climate crisis mm -hmm. and how it compares to the, the pandemic, if you like? Yeah, that, that was a really kind of... Uh, honest reflection, it, it genuinely struck me in the course of the pandemic where we were trying to assemble evidence to change the way we lived in order to cope with this crisis. And I remember sitting at my desk going, gosh, if we think this is hard, you know, <laughs> think, think about the situation we're in with, with a bigger and more deadly and unfortunately slightly longer term problem. It's not this week in our heads, we think about 2030, 2050 which is a false way of thinking about it, but nonetheless, it's the way we think about it. I mean, first of all, they're formally connected um, uh, as uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, changes in land use, uh, changes in food systems, uh, global flows of people. Uh, as, as those things change, then simply put the risk of new viral threats and their rapid um, diffusion and society are, are very strongly elevated. And, I mean, almost certainly uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an example of uh, kind of rapid viral evolution and species jumping and uh, diffusion through society as a consequence of shifts in how we relate to the environment. So they're, they're, they're formally linked. The, the phrase collective action problem I've stolen, uh, that's a formal um, a paradigm in behavioural economics and it was Professor Pete Lunn who you will probably know from the ESRI introduced me to this way of rigidly thinking about this notion of we have to pull together. And, and for me it's quite complex um, it, to mitigate the transmission of the virus or to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions to be more efficient in our energy use. We have to change the way we live individually. We have to make some trade-offs between what we might want as individuals and what's in the collective best interest. But we also have to act collectively uh, in, in the greater interest. And, and there's kind of a, a loop there between the fundamental thing that's required there is that each of us as individual citizens feel invested in the problem and invested in the solution. And kind of the very immediate threats of, I might get ill and die, or somebody in my family might get ill or die, or somebody I know might get ill and die. That, that really created a public yeah. investment in this issue. And I hear my colleagues saying, you know, well, look, we, we know the science now, and, and we even know the solutions. Um, and it's time to move on and get the solutions implemented. But we need to constantly, I think, have this reminder directly to people as well as to the political system of the proximity of the problem and in particular the, the proximity of action. So we need to make these scenarios real, we need to really show people what's going to happen and, and we need to constantly remind them that if we don't change, so, so building that public investment and then people, of course, quite rightly say, well, it's not just a question of the individual, there's a need for government support. Um, 
uh, very good analogies, for instance, between governments who supported citizens to self-isolate. Those countries did better than governments who didn't. Uh, also, governments who support their citizens to be green, those countries will do better. So there's stri very straightforward uh, um, uh, analogies and parallels. But for me, it just come down to the fundamental. Um, there's a great line from the novelist Jose Saramago, which is that every country gets the government it deserves. We think that the government should, but we are the government. And if we want to avoid this problem, we'll elect a government that will also want to avoid the problem. So that for me, this, this, it brings me back to this question of, of public engagement. And I don't simply mean kind of engaging the public in the science and making them part of what we do, but engage, engaging with the public. Yeah. What are their concerns? What are our concerns? And creating then that kind of collective action with, with people, and it's an, it's an kind of academic and scientific responsibility for me uh, to, to have that dialogue with the public as well as that dialogue with systems of government because there's a very di direct connection in my mind between the public and the system of government and vice versa. Yeah, yeah we're the ones who elect them, so exactly. yeah, <laughs> we have a exactly. lot of responsibility there. Exactly. Um, I suppose that neatly brings us back to Science Foundation Ireland. Um, and maybe you tell us a little bit about Ireland's Impact uh, 2030 strategy mm -hmm. and SFI's role within it. It aims, I believe, to put research and innovation at the heart of addressing Ireland's social, economic and environmental challenges, mm -hmm. as, as mentioned. So can you tell me a little bit more about that and how SFI fits into that overall strategy? Yeah, it is a new government strategy. Uh, I, I really welcome it and I, I welcome it for that holistic approach. Uh, to consider uh, research broadly writ um, from the sciences and engineering through social sciences and humanities and, and, and arts research as one of the key ways in which we can address the challenges that face us uh, as a society. So, so I, I welcome that really broad um, vision uh, that that government has. And I think there's a, it's capturing a point in time uh, where I think we are all concerned, uh, having learned what we've learned over the last two years and the last decade, to take the long view and to take the deep view about what are the big questions that we need to address and the solutions that we need to provide. Um, the, the second thing that's to be said about it, so first of all, in that broad sense, it's saying, look, we need to invest right across the uh, academic disciplines. Um, and in, in saying that, to build on that disciplinary strength, to, to create a system where interdisciplinarity is the norm, working together across disciplines, and engagement is the norm, working with citizens, working with enterprises to say, what are your concerns and problems and, and what is it we know or are working on that can start to address that, so working in partnership. So I think beneath all that, there's a clear focus in the strategy, which again, I welcome on talent. This, this is one of the things that impresses me most about the Irish system is the talent base that it's building up. It's as important to us as the specific things we might be discovering or the specific solutions we might be offering to society is that broad base of talent in the system, which is also teaching the next generation. And then importantly, one of the great successes of the Irish system over the last 20 years has been engagement, um, in particular enterprise engagement. So there's a very strong bond between our science and engineering researchers and many of the technology-based enterprises that we have. We want to strengthen that bond into the small and medium enterprise uh, sector, which is more challenging because they're smaller enterprises, so they have uh, a different capacity uh, uh, um, uh, to work with us. The strategy sets out an appropriate level of investment, um, about 2.5% of the, of the domestic economy, and if we do that, that will place us in the same area as the high-achieving European um, uh, systems like Finland, uh, Norway, Denmark, and so on. But I think the big thing for me is that focusing on talent, focusing on breadth of disciplines, focusing on interdisciplinarity and really thinking about how do we engage with the public, with citizens, with 
community organizations, with enterprises, to work on the problems that matter. Uh, it's a way of each keeping the other honest um, and, and focused on the right things. And uh, as part of that um, strategy, there, there is a, a plan to bring together the Irish Research Council and Science Foundation Ireland. If you can tell me a little bit more about that and where you're at with that, and I'm thinking the interdisciplinarity you were talking about there is very relevant here, but uh, if you can just tell me a bit more about that, it'd be great. Yeah, so this is a government decision from late spring, so it's, it's new, it's news, literally. Um, in my view, it's the right decision. Um, both of these agencies, Science Foundation Ireland, which has its focus on science, technology, engineering and mathematics, um, and the Irish Research Council, which actually funds basic research across all disciplines, but has its own particular emphasis on the arts, humanities and social sciences. Each of those organisations has great strength and expertise in funding what it does and in really getting the best out of research in those areas. There is an advantage, however, to bringing that together into one organisation um, which understands the full range of disciplines, knows how to get the best research um, sponsored across those disciplines, but also works to bring people working together across those disciplines. And, and when you think about, again, back to something like climate, for instance, this, the solutions there, and in fact our understanding of how climate works, never mind getting onto the solutions, does require an understanding of everything from the, the physics of how the atmosphere works to the sociology of how we as citizens decide to do different things. Um, and also kind of in thinking about the kind of future we want. We don't think of a future in entirely technical terms. We think of a future in social and human terms. Um, and one of the things that, that, that strikes me is the arts and the humanities have a huge amount to offer in and of themselves in terms of thinking about who we are and what we want to be. But if we want to think about something specific like climate, to also imagine futures, to think about futures, to think about what we're trading off now versus in the future and to help us explore those things in really important human ways. Um, and then something that might surprise you, take something like cell and gene therapy. Mm -hmm. We would tend to think of that as kind of a technical medical issue, but it's not that simple. These are new therapies. Uh, it's a one um, treatment. Uh, they're very expensive to develop. So what are the ethics of mm -hmm of that, how should we think about safety and regulation, but how should we think about reimbursement? How do we pay the drug companies who've invented these things when you get to use them once? So there's really complex societal questions about how we're going to use cell and gene therapy, ethical questions, socioeconomic questions. And as these technologies become more and more advanced, we'll have very deep human questions about how far do we want to go with certain types of intervention and treatment and therapies? What does it mean for us as humans? And the same applies in digital transition. So all of these things that we're facing now are really complex humano-socio-technical problems and being able to bring everybody together uh, to guide the thinking on that and not have it dominated by the scientists or dominated by the humanities, but having a real dialogue across those is very important to us. So we think it's a really good idea. The trick, of course, is in taking the best of two organisations and getting something better. Uh, so amalgamations are not without their challenges, but we're very optimistic. We have a goal um, and, and we're fully invested in, in making that vision of real strength in the disciplines, but a real drive for interdisciplinarity and engagement work. Just coming back to the public engagement and stakeholder engagement, which you touched on there yourself in, in all research, and I'd love to hear a bit more about initiatives like Creating Our Future. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, like in one sense, Creating Our Future is something that shouldn't have worked. You know, that. Um, and to a certain extent, people might have had the same attitude to citizens' assemblies at the beginning, you know, that we have all of these institutions and structures already in society to answer complex questions. 
So creating the future was a wonderful initiative where we simply, uh, with partners, went out and asked citizens and also expert stakeholders, what kind of future did we want for research broadly writ um, in the country? It was done under the auspices of the new Department of Further and Higher Education Research, Innovation and Science. And we got 18,000 short citizen submissions to that. Uh, did a lot of work, um, uh, some quite straightforward, reading them all. Uh, we had a very strong uh, group uh, chaired by uh, Linda Hogan and Trinity College Dublin, but also used, as you would expect from us, some digital trickery to extract themes, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and things like that to extract themes from them. But what struck us really strongly is um, that, that people are concerned about the fundamental questions. Um, fundamental challenges that face us, like climate, antimicrobial resistance, food systems, food security, um, geopolitics, all of the things that are in our news right now, people are concerned that we have the research apparatus to really understand what's going on and answer questions. They're equally interested in just in the deep things that humans are curious about. They want to know why is the universe the way it is? Um, why do we feel the way we feel? Uh, why do we imagine the things we imagine? So, so people are as interested in research on climate futures and in research on the modern novel or you know, 18th century Irish history or the origins of the universe. All of these things matter to people and they want a balanced research system. And there's a real kind of um, um, native truth in that because to come back to the pandemic, you never know the talent you're gonna need in a crisis until the crisis happens and there you are. Um, you know, right now, um, we're hearing from all sorts of experts in East European and Russian history. Um, 15 years ago, people might have said, do we really need that kind of um, scholarly investigation in our, in our universities? We absolutely do. So citizens are interested in the long game and the deep game. And for me, what was interesting was the complete alignment between what people think and what experts think. And that creating our future really did reinforce government's own sense that that's what people were interested in with clear information um, and really reinforce this new strategy, which as I say is holistic, takes the long view and takes the broad view. And I suppose in that context, again, if you can tell me a little bit about the SFI challenged based funding, which I think comes back to this again. Well, that's the classic example of engaged research, which is we don't do our research in our laboratories or our libraries or our archives in the normal way. We, we get out into the community or into a business, sit with people, try and understand what their concerns and challenges are. So, so a challenge-based research project runs in a different way from a typical one. Uh, one agrees a problem or a challenge is that for which we require a solution, not simply research but a solution. Um, and then you go through phases of initial work. Uh, it's competitive, so you'll set half a dozen teams perhaps on the challenge. Uh, those teams are interdisciplinary um, and they begin to work on their solutions and you whittle the solutions down to the best one and that one gets awarded a prize to develop their uh, uh, solution further. Um, and we typically do these in partnership. So we've done some in partnership with the Defence Organisation, we've done some in partnership with Irish Aid, and they will bring their concerns and, and problems to the table. Um, and the interesting thing is it really shifts the way not only the colleagues working on the uh, challenge do their research, but the people around them. So the interesting thing for us is some volunteers will come to the table and say, well, we'll work on this challenge with you. And the people in the laboratory next door or the office next door might be not an initially engaged, but they see the process and they see just how different and interesting and new and exciting this way. It's, it isn't to replace the more traditional way of doing research because we learn so much through that. 
But the interesting thing about challenge research is it focuses people on the right question um, as opposed to the methodology of getting the right answer, whatever the question might be. So it focuses people on important questions and meaningful questions. It creates bonds across disciplines. It provides more immediate answers um, and more immediate solutions, which is why it's not the way to approach every research question, uh, but it is for some. And the most interesting thing for us is it creates a sense within the broader community. It creates a kind of a, a ripple effect through the research community around that challenge team who say, well, that's interesting now. There's some potential research partners that I might not have known. Here's a new way of, of going about it. Um, uh, so we've just not launched the National Challenge Fund, which is a European Union funded um, as part of the Resilience and Recovery Programme. Um, where we're focused on, on solutions in the digital transition space and the green transition space. And we're really excited about not only the concrete deliverables from those uh, challenge programmes, but the way in which it will introduce challenge-based research more widely within uh, the community. And I suppose the last couple of things. Um, one thing we always ask our, our um, conversations with leaders, uh, candidates, is, you know, when, when you look at the area of leadership, is there something that, uh, that appeals to you? As, like, when, what would you see as a really good leader? Like, what? what um... mm. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't describe myself as one, but I think, like the kind of approaches that you're, you're, you're always learning. And, and I mean, I, I came to leadership because I find problems interesting. And first of all, in university life, then more broadly, um, I kept trying to fix things and make them a little bit better. <laughs> and that, uh, as a result of that, I acquired more and more responsibility. Um, uh, the, kind of, the kind of leader I try to be or admire, uh, and therefore try to be, um, kind of reflective and analytic are important to me. Um, you know, what is it we're trying to achieve here? What's, what's going on? And that brought me to a very kind of personal, I don't know if it's a formal term, but kind of narrative leadership. I'm always interested in the, I think growing up on the north side of Dublin, that great phrase, what's the story? <laughs> um, so for me, I'm, I'm interested in the story of a problem uh, or the story of an organization or telling the story of what's going on um, uh, and, and the impact of that on people's own stories. And I do think about it that way. And you often get to very deep roots of an issue if you trace it narratively back to where did this come from? Why are we here? Um, what's the story behind this? Um, leaders that empower, um, I find um, that one of the things that I really enjoyed about working in Maynooth University is the growing confidence of that university over time, that people realized that they were really good at what they did, they could afford to take risks, and um, if they really wanted to do something, it could be done. Um, and, and looking back now, it's a really confident university. It's proud of what it's achieved. It's proud of the space it's claimed uh, in, in the landscape. And, and that, for me, is the essence of empowerment, that you're building confidence in a, in a group of people to chart their mission, achieve their goals. Um, uh, authenticity and integrity then, I think, are the, uh, they're related to that. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be concerned about the story of the institution and, uh, and, and where it's going. You have to really believe in it. Um, so I, they're the kinds of leaders I admire. And, and, and the, the, the integrity piece is very important to me. It's, it, um, I think I inherited it from my parents, but like doing the right thing um, and being persistent in doing the right thing and being honest in doing the right thing is, is something that I aspire to, but very much admire in others. I love it. And then very finally, if you don't mind me asking, but again, it's a question we always ask our leaders is, um, could you tell us something about yourself that people watching may not know or something that might surprise them? <laughs> There's probably many things. <laughs> but but one that you can say on camera. The one, well, actually, the one, uh, like the most honest one, that, that the thing that most genuinely surprised is that I was very much a punk rocker 
when I was a young man. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, strictly speaking, post-punk, because, because I was 10 in 1977, so I was a bit young for the... the so I was more in the muted 1981-82, Echo and the Bunnymen, the Smiths kind of era with the long raincoats and the French novel stuffed in your pocket. Um, Le Tranchet, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly <laughs> that, which I re <laughs> I've reread. I reread on my summer holidays and realized how much I enjoyed it at the time. And those things stay with me. Oh, they do. I, I, I think there was a kind of a certain angularity. I mean, the crisis we had at that time was the, which is kind of sort of present again, was the nuclear crisis. Mm -hmm. So every generation has its crisis and its need to push back. Mm -hmm. And rebel, and to a certain extent, that stays with you. So yeah. there's all these. The pandemic was managed by a group of superannuated punk rockers. <laughs> <That's really. laughs> I love it. It was also written by them. You'd be, you'd, you'd be glad to know I was an echo in the bunny one person. There as you well. go. See, small world. Well, I think that might surprise people, but it's a lovely place to finish. So thank you so much for being with us today, and that was so enjoyable. Thanks a million. Thanks, Anne. It was a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>